Are you aware of the many amazing connections between the depths of the sky and the depths of our oceans? Both are summoned to dark places where humans cannot breathe and where the pressure alone can kill you. Both upset our gravitational experiences, giving explorers a weird sense of weightlessness or propulsion if they could have somehow survived being there in the first place. And both contain many captivating unsolved mysteries. Our oceans are full of life we have never seen before. And who can tell what lurks in the unexplored reaches of heaven? Early on, I happened to hear that NASA had turned its attention to exploring the location of Hadol in the ocean. After all, NASA is usually in the sky. What do they do well underwater and on Earth? Put on your diving gear and join me in a world of undersea creatures, amazing life, and an environment so deep, we've mapped Mars past this planet on our own planet. In 1957, a year before NASA was founded, a paper published by the Journal of the Royal Society of Arts reported that deep oceans cover more than two-thirds of the world's surface, and yet what much is known about the shape and surface of the moon and is known about that of the bottom of the ocean. It was an allusion to the fact that in a world before the technology of echo sounding was used to map the ocean floor, we knew very little about the topography of what was below. We've come a long way since then, but while we've mapped the moon, thanks to satellites and telescopes, we've still only mapped 23.4% of the ocean floor with coal. Of course, this still represents 120 million square kilometers, about three times the surface area of the moon. So the old saying is no longer entirely true. That's why we can talk instead about Mars, which is 145 million square kilometers in size, but it's still a huge gap in our knowledge of our own world. NASA was founded in 1958 with the mission of increasing human knowledge of what is happening in the atmosphere and space and developing the vehicles and technologies that will enable them to do so. Sea surveying was not yet on their radar or sonar. However, in 1978, NASA began observing the ocean with their first set of marine satellites deployed at sea level capable of collecting data on ocean surface winds, surface temperature, wave height, and more. This helped them learn more about our planet's oceans and their impact on global climate. Yet some of NASA's most exciting forays into the ocean only began at the turn of the millennium. One of the ways the ocean can prepare astronauts for space travel is through simulated space experiences. The approximately 8.7 kilometers from Kilago in Florida is the world's only undersea exploration, exploration and reef site. Built in 1986, it is a small three-bedroom residence, spacious enough to accommodate up to six people with a master bedroom combining sleeping and living area, an entrance hall, and there is a balcony with access to the sea around it. It was originally developed to help aquatic animals stay under the sea for weeks at a time through a process called saturation diving. When the human body stays within 19 meters of depth, it becomes saturated with dissolved gas in its bloodstream, allowing these explorers to remain at depth without adverse effects for very long periods of time. Nine hours for one wave rather than an hour or two. This made it ideal for biologists interested in studying the natural environment in situ. But in 2001, NASA and other space agencies like ESA acquired it as a major space training facility. These microscopic living conditions mimic those found in the world's upper atmosphere. So astronauts who spent a week in an interrogation camp would get a better sense of what life would be like up there. It also allowed them to practice conducting experiments and usually practiced in the expected and unexpected realities of life in a hostile environment. NASA launched the NEMO program or NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations 
and that same year began sending their astronauts to the base. Since then, there have been 23 NEMO missions, bringing together astronauts from various space agencies that lasted up to three weeks. Astronauts have been there as divers, getting a chance to rip through the deep fabrics of space to learn what space travel might be like outside our planet, preparing for the day when humans return to the moon or go to Mars. However, this was not NASA's only interest in the ocean. Perhaps the most important lesson was learned, not for NASA astronauts, but the machines that will one day navigate the vast oceans beyond the Earth's orbit. Let us now move on to consider the exploration of other oceans. Our solar system is home to many large oceans outside the Earth. Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus, to name just two, have rich reservoirs of water beneath their thick to medium-sized ice sheets. Despite being only one-fifth the diameter of the Earth, scientists believe Europa holds twice as much water as our oceans combined. This is an intriguing idea, because even if the sunlight doesn't penetrate all the way to those depths, the mixture of liquid water in the rock's depths would make both of these places ideal for life. Scientists have figured out how to best test whether life really evolved in the moon's icy oceans. In 2024, NASA will launch the Europa Clipper, whose mission is to fly by the moon Europa and scan it to learn more about the depths of its icy core. In an attempt to classify its oceans, no, and get a generally good picture of the moon as a whole. However, the Europa Clipper will only serve to validate future missions, which could one day see cryobots soar through the 10-mile-high European snowpack powered by working radiators with nukes to penetrate its seas and see for themselves what lies beneath. Once they land there, no radio signal will be able to reach them easily. Messages will be transmitted from a giant cable suspended by the ice as well as the cryobot. That means such cryobots will be able to descend independently another 100 to 200 miles to explore the dark, cold and high-pressure environment they'll probably encounter to see what alien life might be like in the water. So with mission objectives out there to explore the depths of dark waters in an unprecedented search for life, what better place than the unexplored ocean we already have at home. The deepest parts of the oceans on Earth are only 11 kilometers deep, but because of the difference between Europa and Earth, the pressure you'd feel between the two is very comparable more than you might think. Europa's 100 kilometers deep ocean is thought to have a hydrostatic pressure between 130 and 260 megapascals, which, if it were in the ocean on Earth, would be equivalent to 13 to 26 kilod. This is much better than if you had to land hundreds of miles on Earth, but it's still no picnic. The pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in our ocean, is 100 times the pressure at the surface, enough to crush every cell in the human body or explode most submarines. And yet life survives there, and not only survives, it thrives. Deep sea explorers on the Galapagos freshwater expedition in 1977, using a particularly powerful remote-controlled vehicle that could survive these pressures, marveled K. It's not a barren desolation, but thriving life forms have gathered around the freshwater pools on the sea floor down there. Tuberculosis birds, crabs and fish were found in great abundance. As the scientists made more dives, they found all sorts of amazing life forms down there. Creatures like amphipods the size of your hand, sharks, ethereal, fin big squid, squid that are eight meters long saw, and they looked like strangers. At depths between 6,000 and 11,000 meters, in an area known as the Hadl Zone, named after the god of the underworld, Hades, life had learned to adapt to conditions naturally no one could not have imagined. And this strange culture gives scientists a better understanding 
of what might be happening on other worlds. Most of the deepest parts of the ocean are found along continental plate faults, where one plate is submerged under another. These deep ditches create a unique V-like environment that channels organic debris from the surface down into the mud-filled pool. Whenever a prey lands there, the creatures in the Haddle Zone can somehow detect it quickly and arrive within minutes. Other organisms rely on nutrient-rich waters from thermal vents. If you put all these pottery together into one piece of land, you end up with an area the size of Australia, a hole, and an explored continent. NASA plans to explore these regions with autonomous drones, perhaps whole teams of them, that would be able to identify points of interest such as heat sources, and that would be able to map the terrain using cameras and onboard AI. Like what the Perseverance rover uses on Mars, it's a tough job. Not only would such a drone have to be able to withstand excessive pressure, but the temperature around these heat vents could rise to hundreds of degrees. The drones would have to be able to survive rapid temperature fluctuations if they can survive. In 2014, one such deep-sea drone called Narius was sent into the Kermadec Trench off the coast of New Zealand. This is the place NASA has chosen as a testing ground for its new equipment. Sadly though, Narius couldn't survive the pressure down there despite having won Hadel dives before and collapsed. Plastic fragments were later found floating upwards. NASA's latest drone is a descendant of Narius, a smaller, lighter, autonomous submarine known as Orpheus. Orpheus has not yet entered the depths of the Hadel zone. Instead, he is entering shallow waters with his feet. But if it works, the simplified design will make it easier to transport on a rocket to European seas at some point in the future. Although this dream may be so far away after all, in 2023, NASA's Office of Planet Exploration Science brought together 40 leading researchers from many disciplines at the California Institute of Technology to discuss how close we can get to making this journey possible. An impressive amount of necessary technology already exists. Their conclusion was that the mission was feasible, scientifically feasible, and a sufficiently reliable means in the near term to directly search for alien life emma space on a sea world. The combination of data being collected by Europa Clipper and technical experimentation being done with Orpheus and other similar autonomous submarines is probably something we'll see and for life, although no firm plans have yet been made. When it finally happens, though, when a man-made drone starts wading through those dark seas and crosses the celestial coast, what will it see? Perhaps it will feel strangely like home. We are water-based organisms here on Earth. The first large, complex animals created in our oceans, all life depends on water to survive. Instead of dry, rocky, and dusty deserts, there will be something strangely comforting about exploring seas that aren't our own, like entering a place we already know, even and we've never been there before. Is there something lurking in those alien seas? Even if it's just a hypothesis, saying this could be true is enough. Discovering that life has existed not once, but at least twice in our own solar system will have a profound effect on the abundance of life worldwide. In other words, there is likely to be more life, and we should be prepared to see more of it on the horizon. But acknowledging that it's a challenge, if we just perfect the technology here on Earth, we can open those cold cavities, go into those deep inks, and get the definitive answers we're looking for. For NASA, their mission to find life in our solar system begins in our oceans. For more such videos, stay connected with Space IQ as we keep bringing such videos for you. Thanks for watching.